Hello and welcome. This is Randy with Excel for Freelancers and joining us for part 11 of the Employee Managers where we have a host of new features including employee ID cards where we have the ability to customize each and every ID card and that means adding pictures on both the front and the back of the ID card, selecting uh, barcodes as well. We have a host of features, ability to customize them. We can also click back to employees. We've added a ton of new features to the scheduling including time clock features so we know who's been clocked in, who's been clocked out and as well as if there's any missing time clock and that's for both the month view and the week view as well. We have have added a ton of other features and I can't wait so let's get started. Alrighty, I'm really glad to have you here after a week off. Thank you for the patience. I was doing some traveling, so we did skip a week, but we've got a fantastic training for you today. We're going to cover so many different types of features and events and new uh, features based on your request. So we've got a ton of that. I want to get right on it. In fact, I've made a list. Let's just go over the list real quick so we can see. We've got a duplicate employee notification so that if we have a duplicate employees, we're going to go over that. Scheduling, we've got a right click to go over event. Let's just go ahead and show you that real quick. If we want to create an event, we can just right click or if we want to go to an event, we just right click. Click go to an event. It's going to go right to that event there. So that's a really great feature. I'm going to show you how we did that. We've got a filter by position and filter by event type in the scheduling. So all we need to do is select a specific uh, position and it'll filter by that. We also have a uh, filter by specific event types if they're contained we can do that. So that's another great feature. Well, let's see what else I've added in. I've been hard at work for you guys giving you the best employee manager in Excel so we've got a lot. Scheduling we've got show clock in or out missing we did go over briefly on that the intro. So in both the month view and the week view we have the ability to show clocked in if they're clocked in. If they're missing a clock out or if they're clocked out we're going to show that in colors and that's well in the month view except in month view we're just showing them as colors and not text so we've got that ability as well I'm going to show you how we went through that I've got a uh, we've got to fix a ref issue on the employee archive if that was an issue I'll show you how we did that employee ID cards this is an amazing feature let's go ahead and through that and basically we can get to it just by clicking ID cards and then we have the ability to display print an ID card just by clicking the print button it'll print to the default printer whatever your default printer is set at so that's mine's, mine's snag it so we've got that up there and you also most importantly admins are gonna have the ability to customize this and by choosing from a host you have the ability to choose or hide a label you have the ability to show just by clicking show a barcode on that You've got the ability to uh, show any types of fields just by whether it's on the front of the ID card or the back of the ID card just by selecting. And I can't wait to show that to you. So that's going to be a great feature. We've got uh, also some custom fields here, which we're going to get into the custom fields here. We've got that available to you. I'm going to show you how that works. And we obviously have the ability to go back to the employee information. So that's great. We've got, we fix an issue with any events on the frequency and we've got sort employees on click. I did it at a sort here, a sort button, which is going to sort our list out alphabetically so we've got a lot to get to let's go through it the first uh, feature I wanted to show you was the ability to we had a lot of questions about if there's a duplicate employee how are we going to handle that and so I wanted to make sure there was a warning if we uh, let's say we have an employee called uh, Lisa aim so if we go into another employee and we try to change the name to the same actually it's double a uh, and then a first name of Lisa. We're going to get a warning right away. It's going to say duplicate employees name found. Please make the necessary connection corrections. So that is really uh, an important part. And I wanted to show you how. Let's go ahead and change this name back to. And uh, okay. So as soon as we change it back to an original name, it's going to automatically 
uh, update. So that's going to go, it's going to go away. So we use conditional formatting on that. So I wanted to show you how we did that. And if we click on this cell here, we see duplicate employee name found, but it's hidden. So we're going to use conditional formatting to show that when it applies. Now there are two conditions, two possibilities. One is when we're on a new employee, right? If we're on a new employee and we have uh, Ames and then we put in the first name here, Lisa, it's going to also show up whether it's a new employee or whether we change an existing employee. So that's really, really important that we have the ability to show for both existing and new employees. So let's go ahead and take a look how we did that. If we look in the conditional, click here and click on the conditional formatting into the home, conditional formatting and manage rules, we're going to see that we have here a conditional formatting B8 equal true, B8 equal true. That is the rule that we're using. And when we format that, all we're going to do is we're going to change it from blue to red on a fade, a fill effect fade from blue to red. And then we're going to change the font to red. So that's the condition. And that happens when B8 is true. Let's take a look at B8 and see exactly what is contained in that cell to help us determine whether we have a duplicate or not. And remember, there's two conditions. We have whether it's an existing employee or new employee. So we have to make those considerations. Now, because here's the reason, if we're going to look up in our employee list, we're going to look for a name, right? We're going to look here in the employee name here, and I want to know if, if it exists or not. If it's a new employee, for sure, we have to understand that. And if it's an existing employee, we also have to understand that too. So let's go ahead and take a look. That's what we're comparing it with. So let's go back into the employee manager and take a look at B8 and take a look at this formula right here. We don't need it that big. We can zoom up. Okay, so if, right, we're going to start out with and. There's going to be two conditions, two conditions. The first thing is B6 has to be false. In this first condition, B6 is false. What is B6? Well, B6 is a new employee. So that means on an existing employee. So for this particular condition, existing employee, count if employee name, that's the name I just showed you in the employee list, count if equals, and why are we doing it? F6 comma I6. What is that? Remember, that is the last name comma space the first name because that's the same format as we're using right so what i want to do is i want to look up this employee name and i want to look for something that is equal to f6 comma e6 so i'm looking up for this exact name and it has to be greater than one because if it's an existing employee then it must then it's already there right we're already there so it has to be greater than one in other, in other words it has to be more than two times it has to be more than one time it has to it has to be usually it's going to be two if there's a duplicate so for existing employees we're looking for something greater than one greater than one because it has to exist already and another time so that's important we want to know that if it's greater than one if it's greater than one then mark this is true so those are the two conditions otherwise otherwise let's try something else we've so now we have accounted for the conditions if it's an existing employee, if B6 is false. But what about if B6 is true? If it's a new employee, then I only need to know if that name exists just once, just once in this employee name. If it exists just once, then I need to mark it as true. That means true, meaning it is a duplicate. So B6 is true, that means it's a new employee. Count if, what are we gonna count? if inside this employee name inside this range equals again f6 last name comma space first name is greater than zero so the difference between new and existing is zero greater than zero or greater than one existing if it's existing it must be greater than one if it's new it must be greater than zero that means it already exists and if that's the case, mark it as true. So if these two cases, if this, if this and this is greater than one, then true. If this is true, a new employee, and this and the count is greater than zero, then also mark it true. And if either of those conditions are not true, then mark it false. So that's how we know. We just the important thing is to know that if it's a new employee, it has not been saved in the list yet. So we need to count if it's just one, 
then we know. But if it's an existing employee, we need it more than one. So that's how we do. That's how we mark this as true. So as soon as we type in, let's go ahead and type in, um, again, aim. So as soon as we type in this name, and then we go to Lisa, it's going to change B8 to true. B8 to true. Why is that? Because one, B6 is false. That's correct. Count. We know we've got this in the list. We know we have this plus a comma plus a space is already in the list, right? It's already in this list. It's already here. Now it's twice. So we cannot have that. We cannot have this twice. So we must change it. So, so all we need to do is just change this to change the name and as soon as we make that slight change it goes away so that's a really good way of how we can differentiate and how we can see very quickly if there are duplicate employees whether it's for a new employee or an existing employee so that's how we handle that all right great we've covered duplicate employees let's go ahead and cross that off or let's uh, change that so we know we've we've made that green let's go ahead and change the color on that we've now let's go scheduling right click go to event this is a great little feature back into the events and back into the scheduling so first both on the month view both on the month view and the week view we have added a feature a right click event and let's go ahead and click on an event right if we click on something other than event uh, we're going to get something that's other than event this is the time clock or this is blank oh we would just get a message that says, please select a valid event to open so we need to make sure that we actually select an event like this one right click go to event and that's going to bring up right here this is a very easy macro the first thing we do is we want to create a right click option right click option and we can do that here under we've created a yellow little triangle here as an icon and then go to event now let's go ahead and see how we did that and keep in mind before we go remember we've covered in prior trainings 60 spaces over we've got the event id so this event id is important if this for some reason is blank we're going to return a, this is not an accurate event so the event id which is 60 columns over to the right is very very important we need that so we know which event to pull up on the event sheet so that's critical so we're gonna need that anytime there's no event for example this we're just gonna get that message please select a valid ID a valid event all right so we've got that covered now let's go ahead into VBA and we're gonna start out with the right click and we've added right click in before when we created the new event but we've added on to that so we're going to go into the VBA, into the Developers tab. If you don't have it, Alt F11 will get you there quickly. And then we're going to go into this workbook, and that is where we're going to start out there. And basically what we're going to do here is on select Before Right Click Event. Before Right Click Event, that's where we want some, to do something. And the first thing we want to do is we want to delete a leave event. We can add one more here if we want to because we've added another one, but I think it should be sufficient. It helps remove duplicate entries when we delete. We always want to delete it. In fact, I've got two of them, so I may, I may want to add one more to this just in case it gets duplicated. So what we're going to do is if the active sheet is sheet 8, meaning if this is the scheduled sheet, then right-click and call events. So we went over that before because we have added some right click events already into our schedule remember in a previous training we did add the add leave event where we can add an event based on a right click event today we're going to focus on the go to event and basically the reason that we app the reason we have that option is when we click another sheet and we right click we don't want in fact here's it is you see why this is appearing it should not appear because i need to have that delete i need to have that delete right there before so let's show you how important that is all right so let's go back into the workbook and I'll show you why that is important, why we must delete it. We deleted the other one, but the other one. So we've got to create one more. I'm going to delete this. I'm going to duplicate this, right click, and I'm going to paste it right there. And But I do want to update the name with the right click name, the actual name of our right click. In fact, if we click the right click menu, we are going to see that we I have added one more called go to event go to event so all we need to do is copy that and go back into the workbook and we want to make sure we delete that button when we go into another sheet if the sheet's not we want to delete it so now when i right click here 
it's not there anymore because that's why it's always important to delete it I only want this appearing on the scheduling sheet right here I only want go to event on the scheduling sheet so when we click any other sheet it's automatically deleted okay so it's not there we only want that on there so that's how we can do that we always want to make sure that we delete it at times so this says on so we're going to delete it regardless regardless if we're on sheet or not why because when we when we are on sheet eight this macro right here right click call events that's going to create our right click menu so we're going to so we want to delete it first because when we're on sheet eight it's going to create it if we're not on sheet eight it will not create any right click event now let's go ahead and take a look at this macro this is a macro that we visited before but i've added onto that some features so let's take a look under the right click menu here in the module we were just there and this is called the right click event and now previously we did add these which was going to we did add add leave event and now we're going to go to go event we also want to delete them here just in case they're existing we want to always delete them if we don't delete them it's going to create duplicates and we don't want duplicate items in our right click menu so always deleting before we create always deleting and uh, if for some reason they don't exist we've got on air resume next just in case this is not existing it's going to skip because we have this on air it allows us to go to the next line just in case it's not there or not found now those we've created this previously this is our pop-up that sets the leave button and here that here set go to event button we've created this go to event set go to event button this is a command bar button command bar button previously we had a command bar pop-up what's the difference between the two of them right click a command bar pop-up allows us to give a pop-up just like that but when we go to a, a command bar button is simply just a button there's no pop-up so that's how we that's how we do it when we want just a button we create a command bar button when we want a pop-up we click a command bar pop-up so we've differentiated those in our dimension statement right here command bar pop-up and command bar button and this time we've added a command bar button so we've deleted it set we're going to set the go to event button as a command bar cells control add before two why before two because this is the top position and i want this in the second position right below and it's going to be a com mso control button not a pop-up but a button so here we've set it up and now what we're going to say is with we've created the leave button here this was previously right so we've done that previously this is how to create the leave how we're going to create those multiple leave where we loop through those we did that previously but in this case all i've added is on is this additional code right here and this says with the go to event button we're going to set a caption the caption is going to be called go to event we're going to set a face id of 1812 face id is just a an id so if we were to do a search on google and we could see that you can you can find out many different ways to to do that let's go ahead and just show you what we could do there's some different ways to do that um you could do let's take a look let me lower the screen just so you can see different ways to find that face id because you may want something different in your face id so let's go ahead and tell excel uh, vba face id and if you look in the pictures there's some really good images here and it kind of gives you you want something with a number like this it's kind of small but uh and the numbers that go along with it now you'll see here you see each one of those has a number that goes along with it and there's a lot of them you can search them you can save them but basically the idea is that each one of these numbers is assigned to a specific icon so when you select one you know then you could use that number correspond so that's that's how we we get those and there's a there's a few different ways there's a few different programs that can get you a face ID but it's pretty much simple to look it up on Google you may want to save these pictures in your file if you're going to be using them often so I've done that as well all right let's move back in so now we know how we got that face ID all right so here we are now back into it go to event button we got to set set the caption of go to event that's the caption and the face id is 1812 that is the number associated with that yellow triangle option that i'm the yellow arrow option that i've used and of course on action what do i want to do when the button is clicked well i want to run this macro i want to run a macro called schedule 
go to event. So that's the macro. Let's go ahead and dive into that specific macro and look it up. And we can find that macro in our scheduling module. Everything is organized, so we've got everything named scheduling macros. And we're going to go to, again, called macro, called right here at the top, schedule go to event. And the first thing I want to do is I wanted to mention the, the current row, the active row, as long and the active column. I need to know the row and the column. Those are important. And then we're going to dimension the event ID as long as well. The event ID is whole number, so those are helpful. So we've got those three as long. And we're going to determine the active row, ACT row, as our active cell row. And remember, active cell we use when we're off the sheet. When we're on the sheet, when we're doing coding on the sheet, we use target row. Target row for on the sheet, off the sheet, we use active cell row. So that's the difference there. That's why you see, sometimes you see active cell and sometimes you see target. Target means code on the sheet code off the sheet in a module, we use active cell, active cell row, and active cell column. So we've defined those, we're going to need those. Now we have to check, remember that, remember that event ID, I need to check to make sure that that's not empty. And remember, that's our current row, the current row, plus our current column, plus 60 columns to the right, 60 columns to the right. Remember that? Here's our event. We move 60 columns to the right, and we're going to see an event right there. That's the number, 60, exactly. So well, I'm going to need to pull that number. If it's blank, then, then we're going to say this is not a correct event. So we need to make sure that there's a number in that existing row, 60 columns to the right. That's where we store our event ID. All right, so we need to check for that. That's the first thing we want to do. So it's if cells, and we, the reason we use dot cells is because we've already defined sheet 8 up here. If sheet 8 cells, active row, the current row, the row won't change, plus the column, plus 60. If that value equals empty, then we know we're not, we cannot go to a, to a specific event if there's no event ID. So in that case, we need to put message box, please select a valid event to open to to I guess we could say to go to event okay so and then exit sub we can't move any further if we don't have an accurate event ID so for example if we click on a white space here and we click go to event we're gonna get that message box please select a valid event to go to event that doesn't really make sense either <laughs> all right let's go ahead and just uh, put it back the way it was to open. All right. Next up, event ID. Now that now that we're sure that this contains a value, we can set the value to event ID. Event ID is equal to the cells, the active row plus the active column plus 60. So that is our event ID. Next up, we want to sh activate sheet five. That's our events events sheet five. So we need to activate that. We want to make sure that's active. And then all we need to do is just two things. I need to put the event ID into range B4, B4, and then I'm going to load, run the macro load event. So if we go into our events sheet right here, and we slide on over and let's uh, to B4, and that's where we're going to put. We're going to put the event ID there, and all we're going to do is load it up. So if we were to put in 20 and run the events, it would it would load that event, or any event that we put would automatically load it. So it's a really really handy handy feature. Let's go ahead and take a look at how that works. So when we go back into the scheduling, we select on any event. Let's see for uh, Tanya Angel, this event, Tanya's Vacation. We right click it, go to the event, and it pulls up Tanya's Vacation, just like that. And same thing for the week view. We have that same field because, again, even in the week view, 60, 60 columns over, right? We've moved it over. Again, 60 exactly. We have our event IDs here. So the same macro works just fine for week view as well. So when we right click, go to the event, again, Debbie's car trouble right here. So it's a very, very easy way to go to the event right from the schedule. And you see it's not a lot of coding. All right, great. I'm glad I got to show to you. Let's go ahead and move on. We've got so much to cover. We've got we've covered that, so let's go ahead and color that to know that we have colored it green. Scheduling filter by position. Let's move on that next. We've got those two filtering by position and by event type, so I want to show you how we did that. All right, so let's go ahead and hit into scheduling and take a look at that. 
And again, what I'm looking to do is I want to filter. If I only want to show a certain position, I just want to filter and show only those positions that are managers. I only want to show a, perhaps a position that is an owner, or I only want to show specific positions. I may not want to show all in the schedule. And of course, this would hold true for both the week view and the month view. So the week view, the same idea, uh, managers, and just so this way I can limit the schedule, especially if we have a lot of employees. We may want to filter it down by just specific employees based on their positions. And once again, pos positions are based, uh, the list, the list of position types are based here in the admin. Once the admin, we do have our employee settings and here we have our list of positions so you can add to that list here anytime you want in the employee uh, manager sheet once again we can select uh, any type of position here simply by changing or adding here we can set the position of any employee and this gives us the ability to filter it out so let's go ahead and take a look at this let's start on these positions and show you just how we did that the first thing that what I want to do is I've got a list of employees here, but I want to really I want to know what their position is, and I want them listed out on this table. So I've got them. What I did is I basically just used what's called a helper column, and if you slide over here to the right into column 172 FP, I've used an index match to basically determine what their position is and place it here. The first thing I did is create a named range called employee position. And if we look in here under the formulas, the name manager, and click on employee position here, and then we tab over it, it's going to show you that it's an offset formula within our employee list. And that is going to contain all of our employees. And keep a note, let me show you this one more. We're going to start at the header row, three. Why do we start on the header row? We start in the header row because if and or when all employees are deleted, maybe you're just starting out, we won't create a ref error as long as we include the header row. So we've included the header row, but we've offset it one row down. That means it's going to start one row down from this. So that helps us. We're going to do the same thing when we count, except we're counting A. Why are we counting column A? Because A contains our employee ID, and employee ID is required for every employee. So we always want to count the list or the column that contains a mandatory field such as employee ID in column A. So we're going to count all of the values including the header row except we're going to subtract one because we don't want to include that header row. So we're going to include the header row in the count and then subtract one. This helps us uh, keep from any ref errors when we delete all the content. And of course, that's going to be just one column there. So we're going to use that offset to determine, just as we always do, our employee positions here. So we've got the employee position. We've named that range. So now we can go back into our index. We're going to index the employee position. But we need to find the row. What is the row? We're going to use match to find the row. One of my favorite. A lot of you like VLOOKUP. You'll see I don't use that very much, if at all. I'm preference to index match, but whatever works for you. So to get the row, we're going to match, and we're going to use D8. D8 is our employee name. We can also use employee ID, too, as well. Employee ID is located in B8, so if we were to match use B8 and we could match using employee ID which in fact let's go ahead and change that I like that a little bit better employee ID we can match the employee ID although it shouldn't matter both will work we're gonna get the same message we're gonna get then all we need to do is double click to paste it all the way down that way if just in case the names are not always the same or the names change although they should always update because they are always linked that way we'll always have an accurate accurate number accurate position so we're using employee id here we can use both of those or either one of those and just remember our employee id is located in b here right here it's b here okay so we've we've used that but it also uses the employee name to match it and the names are linked so it's pretty much the same thing you can use either one it's not going to make a difference in this particular case because they're always linked to the employee list in the B, C column. Okay, so now we know how we've obtained the positions. Now we're going to use this as a filter. 
and we're going to use this. And remember, this is column 172, but we're going to create a table, and that table actually is going to start on column C here. We're going to call it on column C. So in fact, this if if our column if this is one then our column here is actually 170 because we're starting, we're not starting at A, we're starting at C. So it's gonna be 170. So 170 is our first 171 and 172. So those are the columns. This we're gonna use for the event types and I'll show you that in just a moment. We're starting on just the positions. So let's take a look. What do I want to happen? Well, I want something to happen when I make a change here to D, D3. I also want something to happen when I make a change to T3. So we have D, D3 and T3. When either of those change, I want to run our filter because it's both for month view and week view. So when we click owner, I want that automatically to filter out when I make a change to T3 or I want that automatically to happen when I change it to D, D3, 2 as well. So we want those things. So both of those, so that's a change event. So when we go into our developers, we're going to look at the worksheet change. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Into the scheduling sheet, we are on it right now, and we're focused on worksheet change, worksheet change. And right now, remember those two, we're, we're working on the types of positions, so that's scheduling. And we're going to start out if not intersect target. That means if we're going to make a change to, again, those two cells that I just spoke of, DD3 or T3. So if I, there's a change to either one of those cells, then do something. What are we going to do? We're going to do all of this. All right. So the second thing I want to do is first I want to check is the target value. I want to make sure it does not equal all types or positions. That's important. We, if it does not equal all types of positions, then do this. But if it does equal all types, then do this else right here. So if it does not equal, that means we're going to run our filter. The first thing we want to do is we're going to set the auto. If it's not, if the, our auto filter mode is not on, we need to turn it on and we need to show all data. That's the first thing we want to do is show all data so that we can run our filter. We don't want to run it twice without clearing the filter. So the first thing is we're going to set our auto filter. We're going to start at C6, C6, and we're going to run it all the way to FP314. That includes both week view and. So we're starting it out if on month view. We're going to start out all the way over here on C6 because we're going to include the names and everything. And we're going to go all the way over to FP. We're going to go all the way over to here, FP. We want to include. I've got to include this column, right? So FP is our last column. I want to make sure to include that. All right, so next up, we've included that. We're going to run the auto filter. And now what we're going to say is with this range, with this same range on the auto filter, field 170, that is our last field. That's the last column. What is the criteria? And that's the target value. We're going to set a criteria, the target value, because the target value is either whatever we just changed in D, D3, or T3. So that's going to cover both of those instances. Our target value is going to be whatever we changed it to, whatever that filter is, whatever we did right here. For example, if we select uh, managers, manager is our target value. So that is what we're going to be using. And that means I want to only filter managers. I only want managers to be displayed here. So we're going to, we're going to hide everything else is basically hidden rows. We're not using an advanced filter. This is just a standard auto filter. We're going to filter those by just managers. So we've done that and that how we just filter that. So it's a very simple code. So back into that, we're going to filter it by the target value. And that's it. That's all we need to do is to run that filter. However, if it equals, this is does not equal, but if it equals else, else means equals, equals. Let's go ahead and I'm going to copy that just so we know, make a note of that uh, equals all, all data positions, just so you know, else. If the actually auto mode is off, then show all data as long as it's if the auto mode is on, it's going to, if we try to just run this code automatically without checking to make sure the auto filter mode is on, it's going to create a bug. So we want to make sure that it's on in filter mode, and then we want to show all data. So that'll show all data. So that's how we do that. We've also added a clear filter button. So 
that is all we have to do. Next up, we're going to move to scheduling filter type events. We're going to go through this. This is how we do the event types. So let's go back into there. And this is right here. This is the event type. So if we click leave, we're going to get only leave events type. If we click, uh, let's see what else we have here. Training, then we'll only get specific items with training. And of course, we could have theoretically have leave and training, but this is any type. And what I have done here is I've also created a helper column, one helper column for the week view and one helper column for the month view because the month view contains a lot more information. So we need to have each. And I'll show you how we did that in that helper column right here. Now here's the helper column. And basically what we're going to do is we want to know if it's month view, we're going to be focused on AC3, AC3 if it's month view, and we're going to be focused on DF3 if we're in week view. So we have two different helper columns. We have a week view and we have a month view. Now the formula, it's going to tell us true or false. If it's contained, it's going to be true if it's false. So if we're going to use this, if DA8 through DG8, count if, what are we counting? That is this entire range here, this whole week view, right? We're looking for something. What are we looking for? We're looking for whatever is in here, whatever's in here. If it's contained in this week, whatever's in here, then mark it as true, right? And we said, and why do we use this star? Well, because Look, if we click on training, let's let's get out of that and click on training so that we can see what. So because training contains training, but it contains much more than training. It contains our event has the name. So I don't want to look for only cells that include training only. I want to include cells that have the words training in it and probably have a lot more, including the event name. So we by adding that asterisk to the end, that's the wild card. So by adding this wild card to the end, that means anything that's in DF, DF, and the wild card. So it means anything after that, anything after that would be also be true as well. So so that is how we do that. So it's let's go ahead and take a look at that. So again, DF. DF3, in this case, training. So let's go ahead and click on training. So now we have training, and now this is true. Why is this true? Because we've looked through DA11 through DG11. DF3 is training. DF3 is training. Right? And the asterisk and the wild card, that means anything after that is okay as well. If it's greater than zero, if we're counting it, anything greater than zero would be true, otherwise it's false. So we've marked every instance. If there's more than one instance, it's gonna be true. If there's zero instance, it's gonna be false. So that helper column allows us to determine if the word training is here within there. So if we were, again, if we were to click on, let's say, I believe leave, we have a few of them, right? So these are all leave. So all of these contain true because they all have leave associated at some point in the time, in the week for that employee. That is how we do that. Now that's how we get it to true or false. We've done the exact same thing for month view, except month view, the entire range would go from F all the way to AJ. So that is the entire range we're looking at. And of course, we're gonna compare that with whatever is in AC3. So again, month view, again, we're looking through DA8 all the way through DG8. We're looking for whatever's in AC3, and again, using the wildcard, the asterisk, that means anything after it is just fine, and that's got to be greater than zero. If it's found, it's going to be marked true, otherwise it's false. Then all we need to do is run a filter, find out wherever it's true, and hide everything else. So basically, hide all the falses. Unless, of course, it is all event types, then it doesn't matter. So let's go into the code and see just how we did that. Again, if we're intersecting AC3 or DF3, is either the month view or the week view, is nothing, then do something. We're going to dim the add column as long. Why do we need the add column? Because I need to differentiate. Right here, I didn't differentiate between week view or month view, but at some point I need to know because I've differentiated it here. Here's our week view and here's our month view, right? So our week view is in 173 and 174. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add one if it's month view. So back into the code here, and here we have if the target address AC3, then 
add one, right? If the target address is HD3, then add one because I need to know. So then we'll use that add column 171 plus one. Remember, 171 plus so it's going to be 172. The reason it's 172 is we're starting on column C. So we have to deduct two, right? Deduct two, we're not starting on A. Okay, so if the target value does not equal all event types, then do the following. If it does else, if it does equal all events, then again, if the active sheet mode is in auto filter, then auto filter and show all the data. We want to show all the data. So, but if it's not, then we need to filter. What are we filtering? We're going to filter it again, active sheet, auto filter mode, then show all data. First, we're going to show all the data before we do the filter. We're going to, again, set our range from C6 all the way to FR. This time it's FR. Remember here it was FP. Why are we going to FR? Because FR, we need to extend it all the way to here, right? Because we're going to use it. We're going to either use this or this. So we need to extend it. Before it was FP, now we're going to extend it to FR. We're going to use these columns based on their true or false results. So now moving back into auto filter, 171, we're starting out plus the add column. The add column, if it's week view, will be zero. If it's month view, it will be one. So the field is either going to be 171 or 172. Don't let this confuse you. This, we are starting out on C, so this should be minus two in actuality. Let's go ahead and equal that. Equal minus two so in actuality we're because we're, we're starting it out so this is actually equals minus two minus two the reason is because we're starting in column c minus two so that's a little bit so when we started my there we go now 171 172 etc so that's how we use these columns right so this is column 71 172 that is how we differentiate so it's going to be 171 either plus zero or plus that's how and the criteria is true remember we only want to show rows where the criteria equals true and I went over that formula with you so that's it that's all we have to do now I did add additional clear filter in there just in case we need to use it we can clear the filter that's going to clear the auto events if they're always it's just a, this is a quick way to if you're filtering it and you can also just clear the filter it's just another way to do it let's go over that clear filter it's a very relatively simple worksheet and uh, go ahead and uh, go into the scheduling macros here and we're going to look at the clear filter which is right here and while we're doing that we're going to return dd3 and t3 we're going to return those to all types we're going to return df3 and ac to all event types excuse me all types or positions and all event types so we need to return the values we are going to if the auto filter mode if it's on we're going to show all the data and turn the auto filter mode as false now the reason i like to start in a high i, I started in row four because i don't like to show those drop down lists that are common so when we unhide these you're going to see when we run those filters you're going to see it appear but i don't like to see these right i'm i'm not a big fan of this so i use those that's why i started at row six that's why i started because i want them hidden these are these columns are you know these rows are both formless so we always hide those so that is why i can use the auto filter and hide it it's kind of a, a cleaner look so i like that a little bit more and so clearing the filter also does the same thing. It returns it off. So the auto filter mode is actually on. It's just hidden inside those. And I know we can turn those drop down lists off through a setting as well, but it works kind of well here as well. So we've turned the auto filter mode false off. So that kind of clears it up. So that is how we filter both the position types and event types in the schedule. And that can be really, really handy when we're focused on a lot of employees and we want to just drill down to specific, whether event types or employee types. That's really helpful. I'm glad I got to show that to you. Let's knock that off our list. Both of those items, we'll give those a color of blue so that uh, we know we've covered those. We've got so much to cover. If I don't make a list, I'm going to lose track. Scheduling show clock in or clock out missing. Oh, that's a, you're going to love this formula or not. Let's take a look. Scheduling. Let's go ahead and take a look. Now, we will unhide these in this row so that I can go over. So basically, as you know, in prior events, we've created formulas. And then these formulas help us. Let's go ahead and unhide that. 
help us determine what we need to show, whether it's events. And before we just had events in here, events, information, training, or leave. But now I want to show scheduling information as well. So before, we would just pull information from this events list here. I would pull the information from this events list, and then I would display it. But now I want to pull information from the time clock list as well. I want to pull information. So we've added some named range in there. Let's go ahead and look at these named ranges. Under the name manager, I've added a few of them. They may have been here before, but I don't think so. So under the time clock list here, let's expand that. We have clock in, we have clock out, and we have time clock employee ID, that's important. And we also have the time clock list ID. Those are the list. And again, I've used the same parameters, the offset formula, including the header. So we, that's pretty consistent throughout. And so we have those four different named ranges, clock in, clock out, employee ID, and time clock list ID. Those are going to be very important moving forward because we need to know it. And if you remember correctly, our time clock ID here is based on the year, the month, the day, and the employee ID. That's how we can figure it out. So we've used all those to differentiate so we can get a unique time clock ID, but it's based on some parameters such as the clock in and the employee ID. So that's really, really helpful when we're trying to figure it out. And in fact, we're gonna need that. So when we go into the scheduling, and I need to know what the time clock is. I know this date's the 19th. So if we're trying to find a specific time clock, and we know in column B here, here's the ID, here's the employee ID. So I know so I know the date and I know the ID. So what I need to do is I need to combine them and say, hey, is there any clock in with this ID and this date? So basically, in fact, if you see on 1124, there is, right? So if we go back into the time clock list and we see 2018, November 1124, and the 1017 is the employee ID, 1016. So we've got all of these, actually all of these on the 24th, which is today's date. So that is going to help us moving forward because we need to know that. So let's go back into the scheduling. So again, we have these, for example, we have 1009, employee 1009 on 11:24. So I've got to say, here's the date, here's the employee number, find a time clock. If there is, let me know. Is, and I, I really need to know three things. We really need to know four things. Let me just write them down here. I need to know, one, has the employee employee clock, clocked in and not out? Okay. Have they clocked in and not out? Have they clocked two? Have they clocked in? Has the employee clocked in and out? Or three, has the employee clocked in and not out? And is the time that they clocked in greater and, let's see, the time they clocked, or actually I should say, and now, the current time, and the, the current time, and the current time minus, let's do minus, minus the clock in time is greater than the threshold. Threshold. And what does that mean? And let me show you with that. Now let's go ahead and go the threshold. Basically what I want to know is I want to know what when they're missing a clock. If, if it's been 10 or 12 or, or, or 15 hours and they haven't clocked out, we need to know that. That's very, very important. But first of all, whether it's 8, 10, or 12 hours, that's something that an administrator can set. And in the admin screen, under the employee settings, excuse me, under the time clock settings, actually, we have set this threshold. Automatically clock in for next shift when 9 hours. So we're going to use 9 hours have passed since the last. We're going to use this day threshold. That's important. So that means if this amount of time has passed, if it's now 5 p.m., and they clocked in at 8 a.m., it's been nine hours. So right at, at 5.15, the time has passed for them. To, they're already missing their clock out. I want to know it. I want to know when somebody's missed their clock. This can, be, this can be set dynamic, dynamic. So let's take a look at this, missing the clock out time. 
and we saw that my list is gone <laughs> but um missing the clock out time this instance let's take a look at this bailey chase on november 24th let's look at his time clock let's look at bailey his clocked in at 8 51 a.m the current time of recording this is 9 41 p.m all right so it's been 13 hours 13 hours what if i change this threshold into the time clock settings to 14 hours 14. we go back into the scheduling screen and we take a look boom it just changed the clock did you see that it just changed because it's now over the threshold in other words let's go through it i know it's a little bit confusing but it's really really important if we look at the time clock list, they clocked in at 8.51 a.m. It is now 9.42 p.m. So it's exactly relatively almost 13 hours after they clocked in. So if they're under that threshold, 13 hours, if they're under it, and in this case, the threshold is set to 14, then good. But if they, if they, are, if they are below the threshold, then I need to have a warning. So let's say we set that to 12. All of a sudden, it's going to turn red again, missing clock out time. So that's what I want to know. I want to know when somebody missed their clock out time and the given number of hours. In other words, if the current time is basically over the threshold, then we need to know that they missed the clock out. So that's how we did it. And we did that through a formula. And it's a little bit complex formula. We're going to break it down for you, so not to worry. And that formula is housed here. All of our formulas are housed here. And let's drop that down a lot more. That's... Okay, it's kind of a big formula, sorry about that. We covered the event types here. This here, all the way from here, is our event types, right? Basically, this part says, if there's an event type on that day, with that event ID, if there's an event ID, match the type, look for the employee and find an event and put the event here. So for example, this is an event, it will display. So that formula, which we went over before, is the way we find events. So we've covered that. But next, now I need, starting right here, starting at this if right here, now I need to know three things. Three things all we're focusing on. One, have they clocked in and have they clocked out? If they've clocked in and they clocked out, I wanna show something like, I wanna show something like this, clocked out. If they've clocked in and they're still under the threshold, like for example, this guy has clocked in, and let's take a look at that under Lisa Ames, I should say girl. Lisa, okay, so Lisa Ames, she's clocked in at um, 4.06 p.m., right? It's only about five and a half hours after that, so we're still under the threshold because they just clocked in five hours ago. So we're just gonna show them as clocked in. So in that instance, it's fine, clocked in. So the three things that we need to know, the three things, three different types of events. One, let's go back into the formula, have they clocked in and out? If they've clocked in and out, show clocked out. If they've clocked in and they're under the threshold, show clocked in. If they've clocked in and not clocked out and they're over the threshold, throw missing. So those are the three scenarios we're gonna focus in on. And it's broken down into just three sections. And we're gonna use it starting right here, right at this if. And in this case, we're going to index time clock list. We're going to find the time clock ID here. That's all that does. So if the time clock ID is found, it's going to be does not equal zero. Okay, so one, that's one instance. The time clock ID is found. Okay, so now we know we've got a time clock ID for that employee for that date. Okay, so that's going to help us. We're going to index. Next, we need to check one more thing. We're going to index the time clock list clock out. And all this, this part does right here, all this part here, is it checks, is there a clock out for that employee on that in cl clock out? Is there an employee for clock out for that employee on that date? If there is, then mark them as clocked out. That's all that does. I know it's a little bit tricky. It just finds, it says, is there those two scenarios? One, two things. This is why we have and, two things. Is there an, a time clock ID? does not at not equal zero and is there a clock out if there is in other words does not does not equal empty right then market is clocked out okay so that's our first one we covered that right here again two instances is the climb time clock id found and is there a time clock out if there is no two mark them clock out because they've clocked out so we're good we've covered scenario number one now let's focus on scenario number two and that's going to be right here let's let me highlight that let me focus that just that focus 
right here. Okay, so in this instance, what I have highlighted is now I need to know one is there, it's also going to be and, and it's going to be three scenarios. And is there a time clock ID found? Okay, that's one. Is there uh, a time clock in found? Right? And is the time clock under the threshold? So we've covered that here. So let's go ahead and so we're going to use and because there's multiple scenarios. And index, we're going to find that time clock. We need to know time clock in. Does that exist? Time clock in match, right? We're looking for match, finding that time clock in the time clock list. Okay, so this is here, right here. Time clock, clock in. Did we find a time clock clocking in? If that doesn't equal, okay, so we have a time clock in. Now we know, is there a time clock list, time clock out? We're looking for a time clock and does not, if it equals zero, that means equals. We need, that means there is a missing time clock, missing, because we have equals blank. So that means, yes, there's a clock in, and no, there is no clock out, no clock out. Again, time clock list, clock out, we're indexing this. If it's found and it's empty, okay, so now we know it's empty. So those are the two conditions that we have so far. We know there's a clock in, and we know there's a missing clock out. The next thing I need to check for is if the current time now minus the clock in time, minus the clock in time, which is right here, right here, time clock list, clock in, we're matching, I'm just getting the row here, I'm getting the row here, and times 24, remember we always have to multiply times 24 because we're focused on hours. So if I, for example, if I do one o'clock minus 12 o'clock p.m., we're gonna get a decimal, but as soon as I multiply that times 24, we're gonna get one hour. So it's always important to multiply times 24 to get the number of hours. So we have to multiply times 24. This is gonna get us the number of hours right here, right here, is gonna get us the number of hours since they clocked in. Number of hours. If this number is greater greater than the day threshold, that's the hours we set in the admin, then missing the time clock, missing the clock out. So you understand that? One, I'll go over it again. One, they have a time clock ID, okay? Two, they've been clocked in. Three, the clock in the current time minus the clock in time is greater than the number, the day threshold is greater, it's nine, 10 hours, 12 hours. In that case, missing the clock out, okay? That's it. So now we've covered those two scenarios. We've covered clocked out, the scenario in which they're clocked out. We've covered missing clock out. And the only other scenario is we've got to, whether they're clocked in. And that's pretty simple. We just need to know if there's a clock in this case, this is the last scenario right here, the last scenario right here. If there's a time clock ID that's found, time clock list clock in has to be found and with the time clock ID, and it's gotta have a missing, the time clock out must not exist, right? So the time clock out must not exist. We already know it's under the threshold because if it was above the threshold, it would be set here. So we already know. So next, all we need to know is if there is a time clock in and no time clock out and we're under the threshold, in those, in those cases, market is clocked in. Otherwise, just leave it blank. And this is otherwise, if there's an error, otherwise, otherwise leave it blank here. If, if it's true, if it's false, leave it blank right here on the other side of the comma right there. Otherwise, and this is the if error, you see if error, leave it blank. We also wanna know, so if there's an error, just leave it blank. And that is what's gonna give us those three scenarios, clocked in, missing clock out, and clocked out. I know it's a little bit, I didn't go over it in detail because we have so much to cover, but I want you to download this, please, and go over this formula, all right? Remember, just I'll go over the first part. The first part just focuses on events. So if there's an event, it's going to return that event first. The second scenario covers whether they've clocked out. So that means that there's a clock in and a clock out. So they're good. We're clocked out. The Third scenario covers whether they're above the threshold, if they are, 
missing the clock out. And the third scenario covers whether they have clocked in but not clocked out and they're still under the threshold. In that case, we're gonna mark it as clocked in. All right, so that covers that for you. I know I know went over a little bit quick on that, but but I don't wanna get you too caught up in just those small details when we have so much to cover. So that's the three scenarios it covers and it cover, and this is the same for both the month view and the week view. The same type of formula uh, that covers throughout it. All right, so we've covered both of those and we have the same, but in the only difference is in the month view, I didn't display the text, right? We're not displaying the text, we're just displaying the values here. I've got clocked out here, I've got clock the clock in time and the clock out time. But look, these are both times. So how is one red and how is one green? These are times, trust me, these are times. When you see a decimal, this is the date and this is the time. And it's fine that they're in decimal formats and it's helpful if that we don't need the formats. We could eventually add some more information or right click. What I'll probably do on this is I want to be able to adjust the times, right click, and I want to change the, the event times based on here, like a pop-up form. I think I'm going to do that in the coming ones. So be able to change the times or adjust the times simply by right clicking and having a little pop-up form. So here in this case, we have limited space. So all we did is enter the times and then I use conditional formatting, conditional formatting to show whether it's red or green. Let's go in this conditional formatting so I show you just how it's done. Under the conditional formatting, manage rules. Now we did cover some rules before which were here and those are for event types. These are for leave, these are for training and you can add your own. I've added three more event types. Let's go over. So if the cell value equals clocked out, color it blue. That's pretty simple. These two are a little bit more complex because they involve times. If the current time and the threshold and the threshold, let's go into these and let's look at green. Edit rule. And let's look at this formula here. First, we're going to start off with F8. Why do we always use F8? Because that is the first cell in our range. F8, when we cancel out of those, we notice F8. These, we have to always remember when we use conditional formatting, the applies to here, absolute reference is fine, it always must equal the same F8 here. That is how we are able to use one rule that covers the entire table, F8. So they both must begin in the same cell. So in this one, F8 does not equal zero. We want to make sure it's not zero. We want to make sure it's a number, okay? It's a number that's important because our events contain letters, so we don't want to get them confused. And here I've included the formula. If now the current time minus F8, that means the value, not just in F8, but every cell accordingly, the current cell, if it's times 24, if it's less than the day threshold, less than color green, that means they have not, they're still within the threshold of clocking out. So we're good. No problem there. However, if I want it red when they're over the threshold, when they go over the threshold. So again, F8 and is number. So those are the same. Those don't change. But this one's a little bit different. All I did was change this to greater, greater, greater than the day threshold. That means the current time, the current time of, excuse me, the current time minus the time that they've clocked in is greater than the day threshold. Notice the number of hours because we multiply it times 24 is greater. In that case, they're missing the clock out and I, excuse me, missing the clock out and I want to color that red so it brings attention to the managers. That's very important. All right, so look at that. So if we were to change this to a big number, you see on number 24, remember we've covered that. If we're going to change this to a larger number, you'll see that disappear like to 20 hours. And we go back into the schedule and we'll see that red disappear. But if we change that to just a few hours here, if we change that to two, you're going to see, I think, two or three of them change back to them because there we go four of them because four people are under that threshold so just by changing the threshold you can change the colors let's put it back to a reasonable number of hours let's say 10. okay so that's very important this threshold here is very important we use it for the time clock and we use it for the scheduling and that's really going to help managers get a control over their employees and who's clocking in who's clocked out so that's very very important also, keep in mind, I've been asked, um, this time clock is a great feature, but employees are required to be at the location. 
I will introduce additional methods so that employees can clock in or out remotely and then bring that data back into you. I'm thinking about Google Forms. I've got a few other options. I'd like to use some third-party apps, but we're going to work on that in a little bit. So I do understand that there are employees that are on, not on site that do need to clock in or out, and, and that data needs to come in as well. So I do understand that, and we'll work through that to get that solved. All right, so we've spent a good amount of time on the scheduling, and now uh, let's go ahead and back into our employee manager so we can mark off the scheduling, click in or out. And we're going to skip right over. Let's go scheduling the ref error on employee archive. All this was, was um, let's go ahead and take a look at that. There was a ref error employee, and the ref error was due to me not including. So you want to make sure that your named ranges always include the header. So if you don't have any data at all, you won't have a ref error. All right, so we've covered that. I just wanted to make sure we get, did cover that. And uh, let's see, next up, let's go into the ID card. You're going to love this feature. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. And there's that reminds me, there's one more thing I'll add to that. So this ability is basically all we're doing is we're using a, a horizontal scroll column to scroll back and forth. So when we go back to the employees, all we're doing is scrolling. Let's go ahead and show you how we did that part before we move on to the ID cards. And let's go ahead and select an employee that actually has some data so we can see that ID card in full view like this. There we go. So now we've got a good amount of data here in for this employee. All right, so into the developers, into the VBA, I've created a module called Employee ID. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. We've got multiple macros in this. And if we go ahead and scroll all the way, I think I've got it down at the bottom here. The uh, employee ID card show and hide. So we've got two macros, employee ID card show and hide. Let's go to the hide column. For the hide, all we're doing is scrolling to column three. All we're doing here, it's very, very simple. It's just gonna scroll over to column three. So clicking to this, so if we right click on this, and we click assign macro, we will see that employee ID card hide has been assigned to this button and of course the icons. So when we click there, all it's gonna do is scroll to column three. Here's column three, C, it's gonna scroll that. And when we click ID cards, it's gonna scroll all the way to this column. Now let's go ahead and take a look at that macro. But again, let me show you, skip something. When we right click, when we right click this ID card button, when we look under assign macro, we will see that the employee ID show has been assigned. So this is the macro that we're going to focus on. And there's a few things with this macro. What I want to do is I want to make sure that if we've selected somebody with no picture, I want that picture to update here as either zero or no picture. Or if there's a picture change, I want to make sure that picture is displayed. So we've added additional uh, for example, let's take a look at, I believe this employee has a picture. So when we move over to ID cards, I want his picture to show up. When we change employees, I want their picture and their data to show up on that. So we've added a little bit of a macro to make sure that the current picture is all showed up. And so let's go ahead and take a look at how we did that. Under the employee ID card show macro, if the employee picture has been displayed, first I need to make sure it's the user has selected it to be displayed. Now let's take a look at that. And to the customize, basically we have the ability here to show up to 18 different fields of whether they're going to be displayed a picture. In fact, the picture here is in row 10. In row 10 here, if the user selects the back, the picture is going to show up on the back of the ID card. If they unselect it, it's going to hide. If they unselect it on the front, it's going to hide. If they want a label, they can select label in the picture. And of course, they can move this label. They can change the font. They can do whatever they want with this picture. I didn't have a label. You can also change the text, of course, on this if you want. But uh, there's no need for that. But I didn't see any need. But you can do that. So that gives users the ability to uh, change and customize these employee ID cards very, very simply. If we want to and we'll go over the barcodes too. God, we've got so much to go over in this. All right, let's continue on. Show the ID number. If we want the ID number, we could show it on the back. And then, of course, we can drag that ID number 
we can show it down anywhere we want. So we have the ability to have either the values on the front and the back, and we have the ability to show a label too. If we don't want to hide that, we can just hide that very, very easily just by clicking here, and it'll hide it. And I'll show you exactly how we do that. We also have incorporated a barcode font here. In the barcode font, I'll show you how to do it. And I'm going to include this barcode font in the downloads. So make sure it's going to be in a zipped up file with this. So make sure you download this so you can get that barcode font. And I'm going to explain how to install that in just very, very shortly. What we'll, So basically what we've done is in this case, I want to show the picture. So I need to know, has the user requested to show in column BE? Have they, do they want, if this is you, you see this you here? See this, yeah, let me just go ahead and click it here. Oh, let's click it there. You see this U here? I need to know this little U with two dots above it, whatever the real name of that is. If there is that symbol in BE, that means they have asked to show the picture on the front. So we need to know that if they've selected the picture. So that means when I click back, I need to make sure that, that it's shown that is displayed always when they've selected it. So we do just that within the VBA code right here. So let's see, if sheet one BE10, BE10 equals with the U, then that means they want to show the picture. Then the active column equals, we're gonna set that column to 57. We need to know that because it's gonna help when we display the pictures. Then we're gonna run a macro called employee ID card show picture. If the value BF10, that's the back picture, BF is the column, right? That's here, BF is for the picture on the back, BE is for the picture on the front. So we have those two columns, whatever's in the back. So if they've selected, if there's a U there, that means to make sure to display the picture there when we're showing it. So when we click back to employee and we wanna click ID cards, we need to know whether to display one or two of them or none of them. So that's really important. So. If it's it, then the active column equals 58. Then we're going to run this employee show picture. And what we've done here is we've just created the values. Now let's show you the values. These are the values, and all these are is links to the values within the actual information. For example, K10 is the employee picture. ID number is J2. So they're all linked to cells right here. For example, J2 is here, the employee ID or the name. So they're all just simply linked. So you don't want to change these. In fact, when we cover our protection uh, episode in a few weeks, we're going to make sure that the, that the items like those are cells like those are protected because that's really important. We don't want users or even admins changing that because it could mess things up. All right. So moving on, when we, we have those, so all of these values are linked. In fact, this one is also linked to BC. BC11, BC11 of course, is here, the employee ID number, but in this case, it's a barcode font. If we click here and we look at the barcode, I've installed a barcode called free three of nine or also called 39. And I'll show you how to get that. And basically that is a font, it's gonna be a download and uh, that enables us to download the fonts. And all I did was download and unzip the fonts. Let's go ahead and go over that with you real quick. I'll go into my downloads folder and we'll take a look at that. And it's just here, this zip file. So when I unzipped it, it just gave me this folder of three of nine. I think I have it here. Let's take a look. I have a few different barcodes I was testing out. So I wanted to show that to you. All right, let's go ahead and unzip that so we can show you that and I'll walk you through. Right click and then we'll go ahead and unzip that file and I'll extract to right here. All right, so now we've got a folder with those two drum and all we really need to do is Okay, here's the folder it is. Let's go ahead and zoom up. Okay, so here's your two fonts. You want to install these two fonts. And there's a little text file with information here. There's a license. And the important thing is it did say here that I'm reading here. I don't have a reader here handy, but the important thing that I read was in this particular one, which is looked important here. It said here that there are two versions. The font called Free 3 of 9 is the basic and standard includes letters and symbols. The font called Free Extended covers all the 3 and it includes all the ASCII characters. So the extended includes more characters. That's why there's two fonts. This is what I wanted to read you here. This is kind of important for us. To create a valid 3 of 9 barcode, you have to begin and end with a special character. Scanners look for this character to know where to start and stop reading this barcode. It is represented in this font with the asterisk character. So to create a barcode for the text ABC123, you have to type out star 
ABC123 star. So it, it appears that we need that for barcode readers. So I've added that just in case that's important, star. Note that barcode readers will not include the asterisk or the stars in the text that they return. They will just give you the numbers. So that's important. So the reason I did that, so in this you will see I've added the, the asterisk here and the and the ID number and then an asterisk. So I've added that here so that our barcode is complete. It's already contained. This shape is all it does is equals to BC12. BC12 is here. The same thing for this shape, BC12. So it equals that. So that's a great way to do it. So all we did, all of these text values, all they are is linked to specific cells. All they are, in fact, for example, the labels don't have any label, they just get created. And that's another feature I'll show you. Here, status, okay? So here's status. So what if we delete that? Well, that would be bad, right? Not necessarily, because I've included some features. So when we click on here again, it automatically gets recreated right here. So that's a great way to do it. And I'll show you how to recreate that automatically. So we'll get to that in just a minute. Let me go ahead and reset. Uh, I think I was using, I like uh, the Arial rounded bolt. So that's a nice little uh, font that looks a little bit more clear. And I think I used 10.5. All right, so now we've got it set up. Now we can change this text, change the size. So just wanted to let you know that deleting them won't hurt you. It, they automatically get recreated in the code itself. So it's a really, really great feature. Okay, so moving back to where we were. So we got the font codes. Let me show you how to install those barcode fonts. I did, note, I did want to notate why those asterisks are there. So now you know it because that's an important feature. And back into the folders and all, I've already got them installed, but all you would need to do is double click on these and then click the install. And that's going to put it in your fonts folder. Again, with the free and right, double click and click the install right here. And that will install in your proper fonts folder. I believe it works for Windows, of course, at Macs may have a little bit different procedure. So once that, you will necessarily probably need to restart Excel. So keep in mind the fonts may or may not necessarily show up. When you click font, they may not show up here until you restart Excel completely. So keep that in mind that you might need to to restart it to have these fonts displayed in your fonts folder restarting all right so now and all we've done is set this cell to the font set this cell and then when we equals when this text equals so for example if we click insert insert a shape insert a text box and then all we need to do is click equals and then whatever cell we want to connect it to and that's all we need to do and then we just need to set we do the format we'll we'll set uh, a, a shape fill of none and then we'll set a shape outline of none and then I'm going to go ahead and probably increase the font here a little bit and then move it to the center and middle and that's how we get our barcode font you can size these up as much as you want in fact I'm going to increase this one a little bit uh, there we go and bring it over because we did reset it so there we go I think let's see that one's 32 this one 32 okay they're both exactly the same all right good so you may have to adjust these as you want but a barcode reader should be able to read those those are one of those slider barcode readers what type of barcode reader are we discussing here let's take a look let's go ahead and do it. just show you and any type of basic barcode reader that connects to a usb should work just fine so the kind that i'm talking about here let's pull it up uh, We'll call it barcode reader USB. You want a USB, and that should work. <laughs> nice spelling, Randy. Okay, so the kind of reader I'm looking for would be this kind of right here. Uh, this type right here. You see this one right here? That's the one I'm focused on. That's the one I want to look at. This is this is the kind of barcode reader that I think would work just perfect for our employees. So all you need to do is stick this next to a computer or stick it up on a wall and have your employees swipe it and it'll read the barcode at the bottom. So it's really, really helpful so we can create these. All you would need to do is print out that ID card, laminate it with your, just get one of those little uh, laminators and then you're set. You've got everything covered with your employee manager. All right, so that's kind of the idea I had. You could also use a different, any type of scanner would work that reads barcodes because this is a very common type of barcode. So you've got that ability. All right, so now we've got that covered. We've covered how we did it. Let's go into the VBA and continue on and see how we created this. Back into the VBA, here we got employee ID cards. We have the field change. Here's the, this is the, called the employee ID card field change. 
what happens when we change it now when we go into the employee manager here we run that macro when we make a change let's take a look at that we're making a selection change right and the selection change that we're focused on is this range here on selection of ID card fields that's going to cover BD7 through BF25 BD7 here all the way down to BF actually it's 24 25 gets hidden so I'll have to make that quick adjustment because 25 is hidden in the tabs remember this row is hidden so we'll make it to 24 I'll reset that to 24 and uh, okay so then what's going to happen when the user selects any cell that I want to run this macro employee ID card field change and that macro can be found in the employee ID card module and here it is right here so we're going to focus primarily on <clears throat> we're going to focus primarily on sheet one so then the text box as shape we might need to create these text boxes if they don't exist so we're going to dimension the text box as a shape we need to know what column the user is on, and I need to know what row the user is on, so we're gonna dimension those. Now, we've dimensioned these all the way up here because we're gonna use these variables in multiple macros within this module, so they are dimensioned above constants for this module, above it, above this module. So that is why we've done that there. All right, now, if the active row, the current row, whatever the row you select, equals 10, I need to know if it's a picture. If it's a picture, we're going to do something different. And is greater than 56. Why is that? Greater than 56 means here. Let's look at this. Equals column. This is 56. Column 57, 58. So that means if it's greater than 56, that means if it's this or this. If it's a picture... If it's this or this, I need to do something very, excuse me, let's go to the picture here. If it's this or this, we need to show or display the picture. Everything else has fields associated with it, so it's fine. But these two, I need to distinguish away from all the other fields because these are pictures. So when this is clicked, I need to show or hide a picture. When this is clicked, I need to show or hide a picture. So that's really, really important. So let's go ahead and put that into I like the ID number there so I need to distinguish these two fields and we can do that first we say is it row 10 yes and is the column greater than 56 if those two that means it's either this or this if those two conditions are true then show or hide the picture so we need to differentiate if the active row is 10 and the active column is greater than 56 then the picture file so do nothing in this case we're going to do nothing because what i want to do is i want to work focus on the text box for now so i just need to pull that out to make sure as long as it's not a picture then do the following because this is all for text right so there's nothing we're going to do for picture at the moment the text box name we're going to i want to set a name for the text box but i need to set it as dynamic we're going to start out with the word box then we're going to say the cells six six in the active column value why is that well what i want to do is i want to assign a name to the text box let's take a look at this let's take a look at this text box this has called box label 14. this is called box front 14. and if we select the back let's see that's the date right so 14 is here right so if we select the back another one's going to show up and this one is going to be called box back 14 so we have box front 14 and box back so it gives it these specific and unique label names for these text boxes so we can differentiate them so we name them that so we know what how to work with them and we know so we use these field ids and what's in row six well in row six is either the word label the word front or the word back so i can use these items here to help me name my text boxes so, for example, all, they always start with box. Now they're either going to be label or it's going to be front or it's going to be back. And then it's going to, of course, have the number here, whatever number row we've selected. So BA is very important because that's going to assign us number. And what that does is it assigns us a very unique name for each box so that we can pull it up if it exists or if it doesn't exist, we can give it a name. So we give that the specific name. So we assigned that name. Let's go back into there. So we know the name, and then again, it ends in BA in the active row value. What's this? This is the number. That number I just showed you in column B, 1 through 14. 1 through 
18 there, 1 through 18, it's going to sign that number in BA. All right, so you have that. All right, next we're on error. The reason we do this is we're going to set, I need to check to see if it exists or not. On error, resume next. This helps check set text box equal to shape text box name. This is going to tell me if it's there. If the text box is nothing, I know that text box doesn't exist. I need to create it. Maybe they've deleted it. Maybe they never created it before. I don't know. But for some reason, if the text box is nothing, I need to create it. So we're going to run this macro to create it. Let's take a look at this macro. Jump down to the employee ID card create text box. Down here under employee ID create text box. Again, we're going to say with she1. We're always focused on she1. The shapes, we're going to add a text box. We're going to add an a horizontal text box. We're going to place that text box 2,893 2, pixels to the right because we're way far to the right. And we're going to place it 162 pixels down from the top. We're going to give it a size of a 93 pixel in width and a 20 pixel in height. So these tells us where we're going to do it on the right, how far from the bottom we're going to, from the top we're going to place it. What is the size of the width? And you can adjust these. If it's too, if they're too big for you, just reduce this down to 83 or whatever you want. Then we're going to select it once we've created it. And now we can work with it with the selection. First, I need to know, is it a picture? If the active column equals 57 or 56, excuse me, first I need to know whether it's the front or the back. Is it, a, is it going to be a formula? What, what's going to be in that text box? For example, this is a formula, right? BC20. But the labels are not formulas. The labels are just labels. So for example, this text box is a label. So all we need to do is just add the text. What text do we add? Well, we add whatever text is here, right? Whatever text is here. For example, let's say I don't think city has been created. Here's city, right? Sunrise Vista. I'm going to delete that. Okay, it doesn't exist. So we, we unselect it, it still doesn't exist. We click it again, now it exists. Now it exists right here. So we're going to say that the value, the value of it is going to be whatever's here in the value. The name is going to be the box back nine. Nine is, comes from number, back comes from here. So that's how we differentiate. That's how we differentiate between it. And the value is whatever is in column BC. BC gives us our value. We know the row. We know the row, we know the column, so we just have to add the value. But if it's column 57 or 56, then it's going to be formula, formula, okay? Formula. Formula, what is the formula? The formula is going to be whatever is in that row here. It's going to be this here, okay? So that's how we differentiate. So we're going to say the here, the name, if here, if the active column is 57 or 58, then the formula equals the active row and column and column 55. We went over that. Column 55, the row, whatever the address is, that's going to be the formula equals, right, equals and the formula, the address. Again, let's take a look at that. I don't want to confuse you. This date equals, we're going to add the equals. And then, of course, the address of the cell, BC20. That means... Right, so if we've selected the date, right, 14 here, here's 14, what is the formula here? BC20, BC20, this is the address. So we just need to equal the address. So for example, equals BC20. That's how we do it. That's how we get the address. We just want it. So now whatever we change in here is going to be automatic. Automatic. So for example, if the higher date, let's go back and change that higher date. If we look at the higher date and we change this date to the seventh, right, it's automatically now going to change all the way over here. All the way on the seventh, it's automatically changed, automatically updated. Because this is a formula, K16, and this is a formula, B20, so they're automatically connected. They the values are dynamic. We don't want to, we don't want to hide this, we can just hide the higher date just like this, and hide it or show it, just like this. So that gives us a really, really benefit to show that we can change it, even though the higher date, look, this says higher date, but this says employee assistance. That's just because you can change the text on these labels as you want, as you want. So there's nothing wrong with just clicking delete, exactly, but if, but if you want to save the font and the font style, I would, you want, you want to unselect, unselect those. So for example, unselect that, and that keeps us very, very, all the fonts the same so it's really a handy handy feature so i wanted to make sure to show that to you let's continue on with our macro 
the name. So now else else here. So it's not a formula. It must be a text. If it's if it's 57 or 58, then it's a formula. Else that means it's the label. Then we just need to assign it. The text equals sheet one BB and the active row. We're going to assign it to BB. BB is here. Right? This is the name, the label. This is the default name that we give those labels. And then we can change them if we want to. So that means if it's the show label, then show this value. That's the text we're going to give it. All right, next up, the name here, the name box equals sheet one, active column. What is this? Let's go over that. We're gonna, we just went over that, the name. The name is this here. We want to give it that name. I want to give this text box a specific name, box back nine. So we went over that. So that is how we do that. We give it that name. Now we say with the shapes, I, I want to do a few things with this text box. I don't want it to give it any, any fill. So we're going to make visible false. I don't want to give it any border line. I don't want it to have any border. So we're going to make that false. And I also want to give it a, I want to align it in the center. Now we can do a fonts and we can do other things with this. So if you have a consistent font that you want, you can add to this. So all we did was align it to the center. So that means every time we create one, it gets automatically aligned in the center, just like this. It's centered. If you look at here, you'll see it's automatically centered. It's not off to the left. It's not off to the right. It's been centered. So that's how we, we do that. So I wanted to show you that. So that's how we create those text boxes. Let's close this. And uh, that's how we create it. Now back up. So now we know we know how to create the text box. Now we know here, employee ID card, if it's nothing to create it. So now let's continue on. If the active cell is you, that means it's currently selected. Then we want to do is we want to hide it, right? So if the active row is 10 and the greater than 50, that means this is a picture. If it's a picture, right, then the employee, then run the macro, employee ID card, hide the picture else it's not a picture not a picture then shapes the text box name we know the name we've defined it up here so we know the name and we're going to make that invisible we want to hide it hide it so we're either going to hide the picture the picture because it's row 10 and column is greater than 56. we're going to hide the picture we'll run that macro all that that macro does is does this employee it, just in case it doesn't exist we got on error employee picture sheet one we're going to delete the picture. And the reason we delete it is because we can recreate it. I don't want to hide an unhide picture, so, but we could do that as well. But for right now, we just recreate it each time, which is fine. All right, so now we know how we hidden the, the ID picture, employee ID show picture, right? Here, hide picture, right here, because we're, it's checked already. And then, of course, we're going to make the active cell. We're going to give it a space. We want to show it unchecked. So that means... If, if we're on picture and it's checked and we click it, we want to put a space in there, we want to uncheck it, and we want to hide the picture, or check it and click and show the picture. Again, so if it's currently unchecked and we check it, we want to show the picture and we want to put the check mark. So that's what we're focused on next. Else, right here, else. If it's currently, this is if it's currently checked. Else, that means it's currently hidden. In that case, we need to show it. On selection of a hidden field, then we want to show it. Again, we need to differentiate, is it a picture or not a picture? This defines whether it's a, this says it's a picture. Equals 10 and greater. If that case, run the macro, show the picture. Otherwise, it's a text box. If it's a text box, all we're going to do is show the text box. Just show it, because it already exists. We know we've already tested to make sure it exists here. We've run the test, and if it didn't exist, we would have created it. So we know by the time we get down to here, it already exists. So we've created the text box, and now all we need to do is show is visible. And then, of course, we need to mark the cell with that checkbox, and that checkbox is U, and that's just the Wingdings font. And we're going to select something else, another cell, so that our selection, we can reselect the same cell, and we do that by selecting another cell. All right, so we've gone over show picture, we've gone over hide the picture, we've gone over create the text box, we've gone over employee the show, this, this will sh show the ID card, we went over that. Hide, we're going to scroll. This scrolls to the column. When we're employee ID card show, we're going to scroll to column 52. That's all the way to the right. Column 52, let's take a look at that. This is column 52, I believe, here. So we're going to scroll all the way to this column. When we 
go back to the employees and we click ID cards, we're going to scroll to that column equals equals column 52. So we want to scroll to this column and puts it and that's a great way to show something or hide something. Now we've also have the ability to hide and show this. We can right click and assign the macro and we see that the macro that's been assigned there is employee ID card hide custom. So let's look at that macro right now. Under there we have employee ID card hide custom here and all we're going to do is we're going to hide this button the custom i want the custom button to to show and i want to hide the done custom right when we're done we don't want to hide it again so when we're done we want to when i click here i want to hide this button done and i want to show this custom button so we have to show this button is custom id button so this one is called done custom button so this one has to be hidden or showed based on and then basically all I want to do is hide or show these columns here I want to hide or show those columns based on that so that's how we do whether we're showing the custom or hiding the custom and again as we add the user rules users only with admin rights are going to be able to customize that if we set somebody to a user role they won't be clicking this button they're going to say you do not have rights to use this so that's going to be really important all right so when we hide the custom we're going to be showing the normal custom button and hiding the done button and then of course the columns ba through bf we're going to hide those columns and of course with the customize we're going to do the opposite we're going to hide the custom button we're going to show the done we want that divisible and of course we don't want ba b columns ba through bf hidden we don't want those hidden we want those shown so that's going to show so that is how we do it that's a nutshell and one last macro of course is the print id card at the bottom here and it's just two lines of code all we're going to do here is in sheet one we're going to set the print area to bh5 through bh22 and and basically that is just this print area right here bh5 all the way to bh22 it's going to set the print area so once printed it just gets printed to that area right there and then of course next up the next line is active sheet print out we're going to print out copies if for some reason you want to print out two copies you'll just change this to two we're going to collate those although it's not that important and we're going to we do want to we do not want to ignore the print areas we want to keep those print areas so that's going to be false since we've just set the print area it's important that we maintain that print area and of course the macro employee id card print has been assigned to that so when we right click the individual components of this group of buttons and we click assign macro we see that employee id card print macro has been assigned to that and this will print to the default printer automatically so you want to check that your default printer is the one you could theoretically assign a specific printer to that command as well so when you print this out my default printer is snagit currently so it's going to print to that and it'll automatically print to that and it'll print an id card so you can see that it's been printed right here and here's the card you may want to adjust the size accordingly if it's not exactly to your specifications you can adjust the size and the shapes as you see fit in case you want to print a different size so that is it as far as the printing is concerned I think we covered just about everything a little bit quickly probably but you'll go ahead and download this and of course if you do have any questions whether you're on Facebook or YouTube please of course include your questions and comments and of course I'm going to make sure to include the barcode three of nine in the zip package so make sure you download those and of course if you haven't or not please check that out uh, as well so let's go back over to the employee information and let's take a look we've gotten over the employee ID cards I did fix a small issue with the reoccurring frequency. If you had a prior version, you will notice that in events here, there was some issue here. This wasn't correct. So I fixed that issue. It was just a formula in A27. So I did fix that, and so it properly displays that. So we've got that covered. We fixed that, and uh, you may have noticed that. Employee manager, sort employees on click. All I did is assign a macro to this. Sometimes I'll, in case they, in case we change a name here, we may want to sort them. It's just done click and right click when we assign the macro to that. Actually, I need to click inside because there are two different, 
two different. When we right click the inside icon, click assign macro, we can then see that there's a macro employee sort by name. This is a macro that can be found in the employee miscellaneous here under employee sort by name. And all I've done is stop the calculations and reset them here. And then I've decided just to sort. We're going to determine the last employee of the employee list. Sheet two is our employee list. I need to know the last row of that. If there's currently any sort fields, we're going to clear those out. And then we're going to sort it based on B4 of sheet 2, B4. And we're going to sort on the values ascending. That's the last name. B4 is the first. We're going to sort normal. And then we're going to run all starting at A4 all the way to A, B, and the last employee row. A, B, and the last employee row. So that's important. Let me make sure that's accurate. So we just double click that. Under the employee list, sliding all the way along. Yeah, that'll cover it. I need to, we need to cover all the way to AG. I thought that. I had a feeling we increased that. All right, AG. It should be AG is the last. Make sure those get sorted right. Okay, so that's going to cover our sort properly. Now we've covered that, and we'll apply that sort. And that will cover our sort button. So that AG is the last column, so that's good. If, if we do add to them, make sure we do increase that sort. This is doesn't need to be sorted because this is already has a formula. It's just based on a formula, so we're good to go there. All right, next up, let's take a look at our list. I think we've got most of it covered. This is a super, since I missed last week, I want to make sure to give you a, a full a training, a, a power pack training with lots of amazing features. All right, great. We are done. I'm so glad you joined us for that. If you have not, please check out the dashboard course. There's an amazing dashboard course. I'll include, of course, the links into that for the dashboard course. If you want to create amazing dashboards with features like uh, one-click sorting, features such as pop-up dynamic picture, uh, I've got an amazing course for you, 15 hours. It's really popular, so do take a look at that. I'll make sure to include the links down below. Thank you very much for joining in this Employee Manager Part 11. We're going to get this finished up within a few weeks, but we still got a lot to cover, including payroll and reports, which you're going to love. So, again, thank you for your shares, your likes. appreciate it, and have a great day. Thank you.